Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. As always, I do appreciate you stopping by. And this video, we've got this Oris Trio. Now I hadn't realised, I always thought Oris did mainly Swiss lever movement. Oh, that's broken. Mainly did Swiss lever movements. But this one's a pin pallet. And it's the 715 movement. So the strap is a little loose. So we'll see if we can tighten that up. There's some of those links that are raised a bit. So we'll close those up and flatten them down as best we can. Hopefully that will tighten it up. As you can see that case is very scratched. So I am going to remove the nickel plating and replate it. Yeah, how successful that is. First we're going to take the movement out. To do that there's these two retaining screws and that plastic ring. So with those out we can take out the rubber gasket. And then with that out of the way, with a bit of persuasion, we can take out this plastic ring. And that frees up the movement. Now it is this dial that drew me to this watch. I do like the orange. That crystal's very scratched and there's a crack there. So we're going to need to replace this. No amount of polishing will take that crack out. Like I say, this case we're going to take off that old nickel plating and use my homemade setup and reapply it. Just put a, a little silicon dial protector over the top. I made a bit of a, an error here. See if you can spot it. As that second hand came away, it come off the stem that holds it to the actual pinion. You can see it's still attached. So that's something else we're now going to have to fix. But we'll take the dial off. And that's just these couple of screws on the side and I loosen them up that will allow you to take the dial off and then usually I'll do them back up again and that way they can stay in the movement when it goes into the cleaner That dial is in really good shape, so we will protect that. And get it into the movement holder. We'll do the usual, we'll take out the balance. One of the most fragile parts of the watch. spring looks in good shape as well and we're going to take this retaining ring off for the date wheel and that will allow us to remove that date wheel along with the hour wheel and the cannon pinion So a little check of these screws, they're all the same. That retaining ring comes away nice and easy. And using a bit of Rodico we can lift that date wheel off. And then the 
Yeah, I will. And then the cannon pinion. And then there's this tube for the second hand. So we're going to need to reattach that somehow to the second hand. With this side we'll start disassembling. That's the date jumper spring. And that's on the screw for the click spring. You can take these intermediate wheels out. Now one thing I did notice is this one doesn't have a clutch. It's a winding pinion but no clutch. Now because there isn't a screw on top of the mainspring barrel I can't take the power out with the click spring the normal way. So what we're going to do is remove the pallet fork and then let the power unwind. See having that broken winding stem and no screw so we can't turn the barrel to take the tension off the click spring and if we did manage to get the tension off it would just unwind all at once at least do it this way you get some friction with the trainer wheels so now we can remove the click spring again on the dial side of the movement that's unusual is to me anyway we'll remove this spring and we can remove this sand leaf cover plate take a, a closer look underneath and these three wheels are what set the time and then wind the watch so this is what is replacing the clutch the winding stem out it'll engage one way and then when you push it into wind it'll engage another way now I'm struggling to get the set lever pin out so I'll just turn it over and poke it from the other side that's quite a long pin and then we can take the broken stem out winding pinion out and then we'll remove this other spring we can turn the movement back over and then start on the trainer wheel side so we'll move the main spring bridge first leaves a, a single screw left for the trainer wheels bridge so as you can see that mainspring bridge sits over the trainer wheels bridge oops that 
one bridge with its one jewel. Again, as we take the training wheels out, we'll have a quick check of the pivots. We've got some hair or fibers wrapped around this escape wheel. Can you see that? That's certainly not going to help the running of the watch. There's this final bridge for the centre wheel. And with the movement disassembled, we can start doing a pre-clean. So we'll give all of the pivots a clean with a Ever Stick, Evo Stick. And we do that with all of the pivots. And then what we can do is peg out the holes and the occasional jewel hole. I'm going to be careful here because that's fitted to a square hole, so a round jewel in a square hole. And once pegging out the front side, I do like to come to the underside and just give them a little, a little clean. And can you see that shows that clearly there? That jewel in the square hole, very novel. We can just give the underside a clean, get rid of any grease old oils and then run it through any holes where I think things are going to go and then for the cleaning I'll put the balance back on and then we'll take out the cap jewels I've got this little tool here to help Now it's brilliant for taking the, the jewels out, as you'll see a little later in the video, a little harder to put them in with it. But with those out, they can go into a bit of version B dip. I'll put the spring in there as well, keep it safe. And do the same for underneath. this one I've got another pot with some isopropyl alcohol in I'll drop it in there that just keeps them separate and then we can take that ratchet wheel off the mainspring barrel just press fit and then we can remove the mainspring from the barrel vent but first the arbor has to come out And with everything disassembled, we can put it into the baskets, ready for the cleaning machine. And then with everything in, the last thing to go in is the main spring. And then we can get it onto the cleaning machine. Now at this point in the video, lots of people put in their Patreon, I don't have that, so what I have done is I've put the names up of everybody that's commented on any of the videos that I've done. So that's right from the very first up till now. So if you've left a comment, you'll see your name up on the screen.
So cases in the ultrasonic cleaner. Now the parts are going into the cleaning liquid. We can start the machine. Give it a short wash, dry it off, and then we're all ready to reassemble. There's all of the parts. Let's start getting it reassembled. So the first thing we're going to do is put the cap jewels back in. We'll get the top cap jewels out the version B dip, put it on a, a bit of watchmaker's tissue paper. Watch the, the bead it just evaporate. And I always like to go over the capsules with a, a bit of pegwood. And then I'll drop it back into the bead dip before bringing it out and applying the oil. Let me put the shut on on top of the jewel there. And then can capillary reaction we'll just keep it together and I'm just turning it over like that we can get it back in try with a steady hand to put this spring back in. Now I'm using my brass tweezers on the hope that they don't start picking up that spring through magnetism. So it was at this point my SD card ran out of memory. So you can't see me putting the, the spring in on the top there, I do apologise. But anyway, now on to the bottom one. Compared to the bottom one, that top one actually went in really easy. So if anyone's got any tips on putting these springs in an easy way, please tell me, let me know. this tool I thought would make it easy but like I say great for taking it out but putting it in you tend to find you'll end up with a tab that's just raised that won't go in the recess so as you can see I'm backwards and forwards with this and that tab there is being a bit too resistant so Try and put a bit of pressure down on it and I break it. And now I'm out of turning, we'll get it to sit right. Just spreading it open now. <laughs> Give up, will ya? Can you see there? See, luckily, I've got spares. Now, I did buy a few packs of different sizes because I did need, I needed some for a previous movement and I didn't know how they were sized, so I've just bought a pack of each. There we 
go. Just to give you an idea on size, there's an SD card next to it. Let's try again. Drop the drool back into the hole. this time less pressure there and there we go that's running freely we're going to start assembling the watch properly and we'll start with the mainspring now you've seen me put a, a spring into the mainspring barrel by hand a thousand times I've added a, a mainspring winding tool. I would have shown you that, but like I say, I've got some cheap Chinese ones and they are absolutely useless. So I always end up doing it by hand. And we can put the ratchet wheel on top of the barrel. Again, like I say, that's press fit. So just while we're assembling it, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about Oris as a company. Now they uh, they were founded by Paul Catin and Georges Christian in the Swiss town of Holstein. They had recently bought a, a closed watch factory and that was owned by Lona and Co. They did that on the 1st of June in 1904. They named the new firm Oris after a nearby brook. And they began their industrial manufacture of pocket watches. And in its founding year, they employed 67 people. So they did continue to grow. And by 1906, they opened an assembly plant and a second factory in the nearby town of Holderbank. Another factory followed in Como in 1908, and then by 1911, Oris had become the largest employer in Holstein, with over 300 employees. That's from 67 in its first year. But by 1914, they'd produced over a million watches. That's some going, that is. I mean, to entice more watchmakers as well, they built houses and apartments for its staff. And at the height, they boasted one watch every three seconds. Oris expanded its range with the opening of the, the Zyphon factory and the electroplating plant in Herbertsville and they expanded their production range and they began to fit bracelet buckles to its pocket watches turning them into fully fledged wrist watches now they were hindered a bit if you like because on March the 12th in 1934, the Swiss government introduced a law known as the Watch Statute. And it was intended to protect and regulate the Swiss watch industry. But it authorised a, a cartel basically made up of 2,241 designated members. So smaller watch companies, 79% of which had no more than 20 employees. And at the time, Oris obviously had hundreds. So it made them too large to join this official cartel. So whenever they wanted to do anything, they had to seek permission. And it proved to be an obstacle. Because they were, at this point, using this pin lever. Well, not this particular movement, but the pin lever type movements. 
and again they wanted to use the Swiss lever escapement and couldn't really but despite this their pin levers were a success and they were pretty reliable but they did take action against the watch statue because they did they needed to grow and in 1956 the company hired a young lawyer whose name was Dr Portman and he spent his first 10 years in the company campaigning to reverse the watch statute and eventually it was abolished however that weren't until 1971 Obviously, if you want to find out any more about Oris, get on the old Tinterweb. Wiki's a great one. That's where I've got most of my information from. So I will link the page in this description below. Add oil into the, the right places before the main spring barrel goes in. And a little oil on the top of the arbor. And then we can put that bridge on. So that bridge overlaps the trainer wheels bridge. So once that's on and the screws are in, it'll tighten down that trainer wheels bridge further. Then goes this spring. That's the, the click spring. And there's not a great amount of tension on it. But before putting the actual click in, we will grease it where it meets the plate. drop the click into place, literally. And then there's a high shouldered screw. And the reason for that is because the date jumper spring sits on top of it. Before we put the cannon pinion on, we'll add a bit of oil on there. The reason for adding the oil is they are friction fit cannon pinions most of the time. And then we can put the winding pinion in and a bit of oil onto the posts for the winding wheel plate but before we put that on we've got this spring to put in there's a bit of a, a recess that it sits in and that'll hold it nice and snug And 
and then we can put that plate on. And then before we put the stem release lever in, we'll put a bit of grease on it. Just trying to figure out where it went to. I'm just going to put a bit of oil in these slots where the wheels sit because they are elongated so they actually move around in, in that slot. And this is the one that will sit where the spring is. So I'm going to oil the actual posts on the wheel instead. And then again, a bit of oil on the centre one. Just going to put a bit of oil on where the mini wheel sits. There's like a raised ring, just a tiniest drop on that raised ring. And then we can come in with a cover plate, which also has the, the little spring on it, the lobster claw, as I like to call it. What I do is I, I get it lined up and then drop the screws in. And then once the screws are in, I'll tighten them up gently, not all of the way, just enough so the screws don't pop out. Just a couple of turns. And then what we can do is come in with a bit of grease on the old lobster claw. And we can pop that into position as well as greasing it. And we can wipe away the excess. And once that's in place that will allow us to tighten these screws up. So next thing we're going to need is the winding stem and I've been on eBay and this is where I've got it from. So thank you very much. Obviously we're going to need to trim it down but what it will do is allow us to test this mechanism here. As you can see, can you see that plate moving along with those wheels? So as you pull it out it will move one way, push it in, it moves the other. So now we can get the pallet fork in with its pins. I always find these tricky because those pins get caught on every tooth of every wheel it goes near. So 
takes a little bit of persuasion, but eventually you all get it in. that in we can put the cock on make sure it's free and we can have the screw get that tightened down and with that tightened down we can now add some power Test then that pallet fork, make sure it flicks backwards and forwards as it should. Just like that. Now I'm not sure whether or not you're supposed to oil the pins on a pin pallet, so if you do know, please leave a comment. Now it's time to see if the watch will run. And again, sometimes a little shake like that will drop it into its holes. A little bit of gentle manipulation. wants to go but that bridge isn't sat properly so I'll do put my tweezers down and then as I pick it back up again it starts going so I'm chuffed Now we can do the date side, we can put all of those wheels in, but before we do, we'll oil everything. And this is where the date jumper spring will sit on top of the screw. So we'll oil that. On goes the hour wheel. And then we can put the date wheel on. Then this retaining ring, get it lined up. The screws in, we can get them tightened down. the dial on before we do we'll run over it with some Rodico like I say it is in great shape so I don't need to do anything at all to it not that I would then we can get the hands on Make sure it does run free. And then we 
haven't put the hour hand on. And again, once that's on, we'll make sure it doesn't foul against anything. Oh, it's come out the holder. We'll spin it around and see how close to midnight the date jumps. Okay, about five two. So before we put the seconds hand on, I'm going to need to put that stem back on. Now what I'm doing, I've got this little vice with some small holes. I've got a pin holding the tube and lining up the hand. And then I'm just going to use a stake with a hole in the middle that will sit over the pin. And then press it down and then once that's pressed down onto it I'm going to use a, a pointed stake and give it a little tap hopefully then that will spray the top of the tube back out and keeping that stem on the second hand just like so however it'll now need touching up with a bit of paint and I have to have a bit of orange. So all it needs is a little dab on that tube. I was never a painter at school. And then once that's dried, we can get it put onto the watch. Make sure again nothing fouls. And the quick date set on this is once it goes past midnight and it changes, five to there, you go a little past and come back, and then you can go forward again. So, time to look at the case and the bracelet. Like I said, what I'm going to do is close up some of these holes. So, I'm just using a little bit of brass, a bit of brass flake, and that's going to sit over the two link, over the, the gap in the link, I should say. And just by hammering it, I'll hopefully flatten those links out and close up those gaps, making the, the strap a bit tighter. Once we've done that, we will give it a, a polish. So we're out to the shed with a trusty drill. And we polish and wheel on the end. And give it a good old clean up. And give the clasp a bit of a polish. move on to the case back this is pretty heavily scratched but we'll do the best we can we'll take as much of it out as we possibly can and that wheel didn't work too well so I'm going to come on to the Dremel it's a bit of a tighter wheel if you like and I'll be able to add a bit more pressure so let's 
is starting to come out. A bit more polishing compound. Just keep working away over that scratch until it goes. You can see there it is coming out. Move on to a, a slightly different wheel now. Again, it's a bit smaller, a bit tighter again. And we'll add a bit more pressure. So I don't think I'm going to get all of the scratches out, but certainly hide the majority of them, and the ones that are left won't be as noticeable. trying to do is not round off that bit at the back so where that angle changes so once I'm satisfied with the back I'm going to move on to the actual case and I'm going to see what it's like just running the Dremel over. See if we can get any of those out and they don't come out. So now for the very top, I'm just gonna run it over some wet and dry sandpaper. That's 280 grit. Now I do have a, a very small hobby sized belt sander which is what I'm going to try. Okay, I certainly don't have the right tools for doing cases, so it's just a case of we'll give it a go and see what happens. Now I didn't adjust my camera angle here, I do apologise, so that's as much as that as you're going to see. It wasn't very successful, so I end up going back indoors, getting it in the vise and using the trusty lollipop sticks with my different grit sandpaper on. And that seems to be doing the trick. What I'll do is I'll just work my way through the different grits. As you can see the nickel coating is coming off. Well, that little mini belt sander did do is it removed some of the edges. Be live and learn. Like I say, without trying, you'll never know. And now I know. I can watch out for that next time. But once it is all smooth, I'll polish it up again on the wheel and then we'll pop it into this nickel plating solution with my little homemade junky power supply you can see it moving around in there it's on a, a stirrer that's what that blue thing is that it's sat on once it's been in there for a while we can take it out and inspect our work There we go. I think not too bad. Could have turned out worse. But I am disappointed with taking off those edges. So one day we might try and put them back on. But we will put this tube in for the winding stem. Just thinking how to press it down. I'm going to use some tweezers. Now I know there is a tool for this. There's a tool for everything. But that I don't have. But 
I'll put this gasket in and then we can put the crystal in. So I did manage to get hold of a new one. And that goes into the case. Then we can put that retaining ring back in. Add the screws in and screw it down. Now what we are going to do is trim the winding stem. So I've cut it down to roughly the right size. Now I'm just doing the fine tuning. And it's just a case of giving it a bit of file. Put it in, see where it is. Do the same again until it sits just right. We put the crown on, use a little bit of Loctite. There's the gasket for the back. I'm sorry for this being off camera. So we pop it in and, and did it up. And now we can put the strap back on. Like I say, my camera skills are terrible. I really do apologise. But there we have it. Then we'll see what it looks like on the wrist out in the wild. And I'd just like to say again, thank you very much for spending your time watching this video. I do appreciate it. And hopefully, I'll see you on the next one.